welcome to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott, and I'm here to read you some scary bedtime stories. Quickly, I just wanted to thank those of you who wished me well through my illness last week. I had such an overwhelming and unexpected response to having to cancel last week's episode, but it was all kindness and love and well wishes, and I thank you so much. Seriously, I... Between all the social media apps, I just let everyone know that there would not be an episode. Um, And you were all amazing. I mean, I think Facebook got like over 100 comments or something. That was crazy. Thank you so much. Uh, My voice is still a little bit rough in this week's stories when I recorded them. So I apologize for that. Oh, and I will be a part of the Let's Not Meet live stream Saturday, January 29th. Yes, tonight (laughs) at 7 p.m specific 7 p.m pacific standard time on twitch um it's at twitch.tv slash andrew tate live or if you have the app just search andrew tate live and i recorded a video for him and i'll be in the chat to talk to you all and all the amazing let's not meet fans so come say hi Before I introduce the first story, I want to let you know that the second story of this week's episode is a sneak peek of my new creepypasta series that I have started on Patreon. So Patreon uh, subscribers, you may have heard it already, but I thought I would give those of you who are not part of Patreon a snippet so you can see if you like it enough to join. That's not the only thing on Patreon, but I have, it's, it's the new thing I've started. So I just wanted to let you see and see if maybe you were on the fence of joining before. And maybe this is the thing that will tip you over into supporting the show on Patreon. Uh, but first up this week is from a new author to the show, Mitchell Robinson. And I know <laughs> quite a few of you have been jonesing for some cryptid content. Looking at you, Rosemary. And Mr. Robinson has provided that for you. Here is Disaster Follows. Heavy droplets of rain bounced off the truck's windshield. Too much for the wipers that drowned under the waterfall of the glass pane that separated me from the stormy woods and the mud that my tires drudged through. Rainwater sloshed in waves within the truck bed. But that was okay. She was in the truck with me, where she could stay dry. The headlights of the truck were dim on a good day, when it wasn't storming, and they didn't have the task of lighting the whole forest by themselves. So, unfortunately, that night, they were useless. Every so often, the truck would drive beneath the limb of one of the overhead trees for long enough to break the constant static of pounding rain. But when I passed the limb, it fell heavier covering once again the Buck Owens song on the radio. I couldn't quite tell what song it was. The static of the rain on the truck roof drowned it out. But it had to be old Buck. I would recognize that voice anywhere. Underneath her, in the front seat, was a six-pack of PBRs. Or at least, it used to be a six-pack. Only three of them were still in the plastic ring. The other three were on the floorboard, with their tabs open. Empty. They were accompanied by a few more empty cans from a since-disposed-of different pack, and a full box of shotgun shells. I pulled the third from the last can from the base of the leather seat, and cracked it open with one hand. Foam spilled out over my hand and onto my blue work shirt on the way to my mouth. Amy would have objected to my drinking, especially drinking while driving. That's why the beer was still warm and still in the plastic packaging. I had just picked it up from the pick-and-save grocery store. It was one of the only two stops I had made on what I guess will probably be the last road trip I ever take. I never used to keep liquor in the house, not even beer or wine, 
because of Amy. She was a born-again Christian, and RJ was well on his way to be one too. Even though, retrospectively, I was further from conversion than she would have figured, I still agreed to abstain from drinking in the house. It'll be a bad example to RJ, she would say. And she was right, like she always was. He's only six years old, I would futilely rebuttal. He's not thinking about that stuff. You don't think that he's watching every move you make? And he was. So that was that as far as the drinking went. For the time being, anyway. It was Christmas Eve. And unlike any Christmas Eve I can remember, especially in the last six years, the only significance was that it had been nine days since my wife and son left the house for the last time. It had been nine days since I had gotten that phone call before I pulled my phone out of the wall and smashed it on the kitchen floor into a hundred pieces. The worst part was that I could have gone with them. This was, of course, one of the many worst parts that I constantly reminded myself of in the hundreds of inescapable hours of thought that had plagued me. But the one that I kept coming back to. Amy had asked me on that Friday morning before I went to work if I was coming to the tent revival with them. Reverend Aaron Watts will be there, Raj. You said that the next time he came into town you wanted to hear him speak. As much as I would have liked to deny recognizing any evangelist's name, and that the exchange that she described between us happened exactly as she said it, I couldn't. I really had told her that the last time Reverend Watts was in town, because of how she raved about his preaching, that if he came back, all three of us would go hear him even though I thought that Watts would probably never come back. Or at least that when he did, Amy would forget about it. Part of me really meant it. Or at least, I would like to think so. Maybe if we hadn't had the conversation at 4.45 a.m. just before I went to work, after what seemed like a particularly long week, I would have said sure. But I turned her down and went to work. It must have been about two hours after our conversation, while I was at the cement plant. Amy woke up RJ and asked him if he wanted to come to the tent revival with her. Maybe he asked if Daddy was coming first, thought a little harder when she said no and sorry, but said that he did anyway. Or maybe he didn't ask about me at all. Maybe he said that he didn't really want to go, but decided to anyway when he saw the disappointed look in his mother's eyes. Kids have more sympathy for adults, especially their parents, than most people realize. Whatever their conversation looked like, the two of them decided that they would go. I got home from my shift 12 hours later, at 5 o'clock, to an empty house. I didn't have enough time to finish making my sandwich before I got a call. Hello? It was from Patricia Lawson, our neighbor since we moved in a couple of years before RJ was born, though I didn't know it was her at the time. She asked him if I had heard. The wailing and cracks in her voice made what she said just less than impossible to decipher. And before I asked what she meant by heard, I asked her over and over again to whom I was speaking. I found out later, but she didn't bother to tell me then. Oh God, Roger, I was just about to turn onto the silver bridge and it just collapsed. She sobbed and sniffled. Amy, 
Amy and RJ were on it. You have to come over here. It's terrible. I did. And it was. Traffic was backed up three quarters of a mile to the bridge. I had only ever seen congestion that bad in the movies, when people were somewhere like New York City. The red shine of taillights irritated my already worsening headache. But ahead of them, I could see what only two hours ago was the bridge. One side of it hung from the massive block of concrete that was supposed to have supported the bridge, like a steel ramp leading down into the river. The other half of the bridge, on the side closest to my stopped truck, was completely submerged in the water and looked to have disappeared. I wanted so badly to scream but my voice left me as soon as I saw the wreckage. I put the truck in park, got out and ran to the riverbank. The rocky surface of the bank stood about 60 feet from the surface of the water. And I looked out into the river, but saw no cars in the water. That was the first time that was the first time I saw it. The monster. I can't remember seeing it come into my line of vision. I only remember it being there. Right at the base of the river. It had its back to me at first. And looked like a man. Especially at dusk. Where his dark figure could have been chalked up to him having black hair and wearing a black coat. He was tall. I could tell that even from how far away he was standing. I would have guessed six foot five. But now I think I was about seven or eight inches off. It wasn't until he, it, turned around that I realized what I was looking at and what was looking into the water was not human. Each minute that I stood staring at the wreckage, the air grew cooler and the sky grew darker, naturally brightening the artificial lights of the police cruisers, fire trucks, and ambulances. The water, though, had faded to near blackness. The street lamps that lined the top of the bridge, having sunk to the bottom of the river. With the dark water behind the creature at the bank, his eyes glowed bright red. I looked into them, unable to shut my own, that were red in their own right and wet with tears, and they began to burn. In these four months since, I have struggled with the idea that maybe the next thing I remember did not actually happen. The nightmares which have not contained themselves tonight alone, and my frequent lapses of memory have obscured the line of reality and illusion so violently that I hesitate to tell any of this story, but at the risk of sounding delusional, I must. As I stared, unwillingly, into those circular red eyes that took up most of its face and were unhidden by human eyelids, I could hear his voice. For only a moment, the screams of the mothers and children and neighbors and friends and sirens and car horns deadened in my mind and were replaced by this thundering rumble in my ears. It was so low that my whole chest shook with it, but the ground under me did not. 
I wanted so badly to look around and see how everyone else was reacting to what surely must be an earthquake. But I couldn't take my eyes off the thing. Thinking back on it, looking to everyone else, would have done me no good. Because it was only I who heard it. Who heard it. Its voice was the only thing that I could hear over the bass rumble. I can't describe how it sounded except to say that it was almost human. Physically, the monster was far from it. But in his voice, there was an artificial, distinctly human quality. It was an imitation, nearly passable, but by virtue of coming from that thing, the closeness made it all the more abominable. It must have stood no nearer than 50 yards from me. But his voice was in my brain, as if I was the one thinking it. It said, So is my first That phrase, as inconsequential as the meaning is to me, has not left my mind since its forced entrance. Maybe it's from its own language. Maybe it means no more than a dog's bark or a pig's squeal. But I can't help but think it was that thing's way of talking to me. When the booming buzz left my ears, and they refilled with sirens and screaming, and the howling of the freezing wind, my eyes were no longer locked with its. I drew no jerked my gaze away and blinked, feeling like I had been maced. When I looked back, the creature spread its wings that were twice the size of its body, which it had been hiding during our conversation, and flew straight up into the air. The moon on that night was covered by dark nighttime clouds, as were the stars, so it disappeared into the blackness of the sky, traceable by only the beam of red lights that radiated from its evil eyes. I can't remember anything else that happened on that night. I think that Patricia drove me home, but I don't know how my truck made it back to the house. I don't remember going to bed, but I woke up the next day having missed the morning completely in my undershirt and briefs as I would have chosen and on the side of the bed that I always sleep on. Despite the emptiness of Amy's side. I remember very little of the week and a half that fell between the collapse and my road trip to the woods. I couldn't bear to be in the house alone. But my boss, a good friend to me and my father, who worked at the same plant as me before his passing, told me to take a couple of days off. So I spent a lot of time at Nick's water and hole. It had been several months, at the very least since the last time I'd been there. But the one thing I do remember is that Big Frank, the bartender, was happy to see me. December 26th started the four-day binge that would cost me my job when I tried to go back to work. As good a friend as my boss Pete Anderson had been to me and my father both, I made the decision for him when I punched Gary Felton in the mouth for asking about Amy and RJ, and on the second swing, caught Mr. Anderson in the eye, then passed out. This was one of the stories that had to be told to me after it happened. They recovered Amy and RJ's body from the river, which was more than could be said for a couple of the poor souls who were on the bridge that evening. Amy's mother and father, whom I have never been fond of and who would give 
a similar, if not harsher, account of me, arranged it. They told me that the three of us came to the conclusion together that I was in no shape to handle it, and they would take it with care. I'll have to take their word for that one. But regardless, they were right. On the morning of the funeral, the 21st of December, I woke up in a jail cell with the second worst hangover of my life. At that time, it was the worst. If they had told me that I had beaten a guy to death the night before, I wouldn't have even pretended to be surprised. Thankfully, I had only been too drunk to walk and got the cops called on me for causing a scene outside the rose petal. But I missed the service. They had a joint service at the 39th Street Community Church of God. Closed casket, of course. And then a graveside. When I finally got there, it was just me and them. And I sat with them until the sunset. I don't stay outside after sunset anymore. For the next two days, I drank on the porch and in the backyard and occasionally in the bed of my truck, not wanting to disrespect Amy's wishes. And thought. I thought about it. I thought about what it said to me from inside my own head. I thought, it's the one who did it. I thought that a lot. I don't know exactly how I knew, but I knew it all right. I still do. I heard on the radio since then that it came to warn us about it. The collapse, I mean. Other people had seen it. Or at least they claimed they did. But no one that I've heard has said it talked to them. Maybe that's how I know that it didn't come to warn the town of the disaster. It came to cause it. I don't claim to know exactly how the creature works, or even what it is. What I do know, though, is that thing was inside my head. And I looked into its eyes, and they were wicked. And its voice was wicked. As far as I can tell, that means that I know more about it than anyone else in town. And that makes it mine. It chose me. And now it's mine. I think that's how I knew where it would be on Christmas Eve. As the woods thickened on either side of the truck, the mud trail faded to a grass trail. And soon, it would cease to be a trail at all. That's how I knew I was getting closer. It was a monster. And monsters live in the woods. I crushed the empty can and tossed it on the floorboard with its kin and reached out towards her. I slid my hand up and down her barrel, then down to her woodstock. She was tall and slender, with her butt on the floor and her muzzle leaned against the headrest, riding shotgun. I felt for her trigger, but dared not to push it. Not yet. In time, I told her. She was a Remington 870 12 gauge, and she was a beauty, and the only woman left in my life. I never did much hunting myself, just used her for protection around the house. And that meant the poor thing got left locked in the cabinet for too long. And boy, was she happy to come with me. It was about the time when the truck started bouncing, making the transition from dirt road to off-road on the soaked grass that a white-tailed deer stumbled into the light. Its glassy eyes twinkled at me, and I saw it grunt, but only heard the rain outside. 
I rammed my foot onto the brake pedal and pushed into the steering wheel, trying to keep my body from slamming into it. In the fraction of a second that I couldn't even recall even after it just happened, the airbag deployed and the steel of the hood crumpled up around the shape of the buck that had become intertwined with the truck's front end. I laid my head back on the headrest, and when I consciously looked in front of me, after God knows how long, the bloody body of the deer was lit by only one headlight that now faced the wrong direction. The mangled body of the deer laid propped up in the truck, mere feet from my face, but it was not yet a carcass. Its antlers shook back and forth, casting shadows of a winter tree in a lightning storm behind it in the dim light from its automotive predator. It screamed for help, and this time I could hear it. And I was thankful, if only for less than a moment, that it didn't sound human at all. Then, all at once, just like at the bridge that night, a sound invaded my brain, and sounds of the rain and the wailings of the red-tailed deer were replaced by it. It was the deep, static sound, and it was so loud that it felt like it was swelling inside my brain, spreading it apart. It distracted me long enough that I missed the deer disappearing from right in front of my cracked windshield. I leaned forward and looked around, still holding my head pushing my temples together because of the oppressive noise that drove them away from each other like the same poles of a magnet. But it was gone. I reached for her from the front seat, but I was forced back into the headrest of my own. The buck wailed again, and now so did I. My windshield had caved in toward me and sprinkled bits of glass onto the dashboard. The deer's body filled what was now the bowl of the glass pane, almost close enough to touch my nose, and no longer moved its antlers, but still cried that horrible noise, barely penetrating the ring in my ears. It, the creature, fell from the sky, invisible to me for the roof of my truck, wrapped its wet, furry, gray fingers around the deer's body and pulled it up with it when it ascended back into the sky and dropped it back on the windshield. I stepped on the gas pedal and the car roared but did not move. I pulled the handle and pushed on the door but it was bent inward and would not budge. Then the deer, now a carcass, fell onto the windshield for the third time and broke through. Its antlers ripped into the leather interior and scratched holes into my shirt. Its blood splashed onto me and the shards of glass that filled the front two seats. I pulled her out of the passenger seat, and by the time I swung her around to where the deer had been, it was soaring twenty feet in front of the truck and into a tree where it bounced limply off and fell to its gravesite. It had replaced it crouching on the bent hood of my truck, having thrown the deer behind itself. The once dark forest was then lit almost entirely in the red light that illuminated from its huge eyes. When it leaned into me, the buzz grew lower in pitch and unbearably louder. The only sound that stopped it was the blast from the shotgun that it thrust its body into. It flew back, this time not with the ten-foot wings that were outspread from its back, but from the force of the twelve-gauge. I stood up and leaned my whole torso through the shattered hole of the windshield and felt for the first time the pain in my leg. I would find out later that it had been broken above the knee and on the ankle. I screamed and sat all of my weight on the dashboard long enough to load another round and get off another shot. It simply jumped in the same spot that it fell to initially. It laid there in the beam of the one working headlight, 
looking up into the night with its eyes still shining. I reached down into the floorboard again for another shell. Then the sound started again. A warm stream of blood flowed out of both of my ears, and I dropped the shotgun to cover them in a final effort to keep my head from exploding. I looked down at my hands, and the thick blood they were covered in was being washed away in the rain. Then they were illuminated in red light. The monster was standing looked at me, and I couldn't look away, nor could I move my hands to reach for the gun. Its wings were spread, and some of the light escaped through the holes in the thin skin that was stretched over them. It also had dark holes in its stomach that bled heavily down his legs and into the mud. Dark blood almost human. It did not try to fly at me this time. It only stared at me, and I at it, until I could take the noise in my head no more, and fell out of the truck. I laid there on the ground with the rain falling on me for only a moment, before I passed out. The last thing I saw that night was the creature hobbling, not flying, away from me. It was almost certainly in those moments before the world went dark and my head went quiet, that cells in my brain, where it had been, began to mutate. It has been almost six months since that night, and in that time, I have lost 35 pounds been hospitalized on three occasions and had two seizures. Dr. Woodward said that the brain tumor was inoperable and that I'll be lucky if I have another three months left in me. I have to disagree. The radio in my house stays on at all times these days and the television stays off. My eyes burned for several days after my encounter with it. They were swollen and red and dry. And on New Year's Day, I lost my sight. Completely. All that I see now are dark shapes. And everything I see looks like it. Only without the glowing red eyes. The radio, when I sit by it, which is most of what I do, helps to drown out the subtle, deep ring in my ears. And I listen for a report that someone has seen it again. So far, no one has, and I hope they never will. I'm not as optimistic as I once was. Goodbye, all. Signed, Roger Millette, Sr. And last story for the evening is a piece of the latest creepypasta from Patreon. The full episode is available on Patreon and it's got two stories. So this is one of two stories and there's another episode too. Um, there's our, so that's two, <laughs> it just made you all do math. There are two creepy pasta episodes out so far. The second one, which is what this story is from, has two stories on it. And this is the first one. Okay. <laughs> anyway, this is Ikbar Bigelstein. When I was a small child, I was terrified of the dark. I still am, but back when I was around six years old, I couldn't go a full night without crying out for one of my parents to search beneath my bed or in my closet for whatever monster I thought was waiting to eat me. Even with a nightlight, 
I would still see dark shapes moving around the corners of the room, or strange faces looking in on me from my bedroom window. My parents would do their best to console me, telling me that it was just a bad dream or a trick of the light. But in my young mind, I was positive that the second I fell asleep, the bad things would get me. Most of the time, I would just hide under the blankets until I became tired enough to stop worrying. But every now and then, I would become so panicked that I would run screaming into my parents' room, waking up my brother and sister in the process. After an ordeal like that, there would be no way anyone would be getting a full night's rest. Eventually, after one particularly traumatizing night, my parents had had enough. Unfortunately for them, they understood the futility in arguing with a six-year-old and knew that they would be unable to convince me to rid myself of childish fears through reason and logic. They had to be clever. It was my mother's idea to stitch together my little bedtime friend. She collected a large assortment of random pieces of fabric and her sewing machine and created what I would later refer to as Mr. Ikbar Bigglestein, or Ick for short. Ick was a sock monster, as my mother called him. He was made to keep me safe while I slept at night by scaring away all the other monsters. He was pretty damn creepy, I have to admit. Honestly, looking back on it all now, I'm still impressed that my mom could think of something so strange and disturbing looking. Ikbar had the stitched together look of a Frankenstein gremlin with big white button eyes and floppy cat ears. His little arms and legs were made from a pair of my sister's black and white striped socks and the half of his face that was green was made from one of my brother's tall football socks. His head could have been described as bulbous and for his mouth, my mom attached a piece of white fabric and sewed in a zigzag pattern to shape a wide grin of sharp teeth. I loved him at once. From then on, Ick never left my side, so long as it was after dusk, of course. Ick didn't like the sun, and would get upset if I tried to bring him to school with me. But that was okay. I only needed him at night to keep away the boogeymen, which was what he was good at. So, every night at bedtime, Ick would tell me where the monsters were hiding, and I would place him near the section of my room closest to the spookiness. If there was something in the closet, Ick would block the door. If there was a dark creature scratching at my window, Ick would be pressed up against the glass. If there was a big hairy beast under my bed, then under the bed he went. Sometimes the monsters weren't even in my room. Sometimes they would hide in my dreams, and Ikbar would have to come with me into my nightmares. It was fun bringing Ick into my dream world, as he and I would spend hours fighting off ghouls and demons. The best part was, in my dreams, Ick could talk to me for real. How much do you love me? He would ask. More than anything, I would always tell him. One night, in a dream, after I had lost my first tooth, Ick asked me for a favor. Can I have your tooth? I asked him why. To help me kill the bad things, he said. The next morning at breakfast, my mom asked me where my tooth went. From what she told me, the tooth fairy didn't find it under my pillow. When I told her that I gave it to Ikbar, she just shrugged and went back to feeding my little sister. From then on, every time I lost a tooth, I would give it to Ick. He would always thank me, of course, and tell me that he loved me. Eventually, though, I ran out of baby teeth, and I was beginning to get a little too old to still be playing with dolls. So Ick just sat there on my bookshelf, collecting dust, slowly fading away from my attention. 
Over time, the nightmares, however, became worse than ever. So bad that they even began to follow me to the waking world, terrorizing every dark corner or rustle in the bushes. After one particularly bad night, biking home from a friend's house, where I swore a pack of rabid dogs were chasing me, I got home to find something strange waiting for me in my room. There, on my bed, standing fully upright in the soft glow of the moonlight from my window, was Iqbar. At first, I just thought my eyes were playing tricks on me again. They had been all evening, so I tried to flick on the lights. Another flick of the light switch. Then another, and another, with no change to the darkness. It was then that I started to get nervous. I backed away slowly towards the door behind me, my eyes never leaving the shape of Ick's silhouette, my hand awkwardly outstretched behind, reaching for the doorknob. I was just about to get my ass out of there when I heard the door slam itself shut, locking me into blackness. In nothing but shadows and silence, I stood frozen in place, not even breathing. For how long, I can't say, but after what felt like a lifetime of cold fear, I heard the shrill, familiar voice. You stopped feeding me, so why should I protect you? Protect me from what? Let me show you. I blinked once, and everything changed. I wasn't in my bedroom anymore. I was somewhere else. It wasn't hell, but the comparison wasn't far off. It was some sort of forest. A horrible, nightmarish place where partial embryonic abortions hung from the canopy and the ground swarmed with carnivorous insects. A thick fog wafted through the air, and with it, the stench of rotting meat, while chartreuse lightning flashed across the night sky. In the distance, I could hear the agonizing screams of something not quite human. My head throbbed like it was about to explode, the pain forcing out a river of tears. In my mind, I heard his voice again. I felt earth-shaking footsteps approaching fast. I'm the only one who can stop it. It was behind me now. Huge and angry. Hot breath across my back. Bring what I need, and I... <gasps> I woke up before I could turn around. The following day, I raided my parents' closet for my brother's baby teeth giving them all to Iqbar. Almost immediately, the night terror ceased, and I was more or less able to go on about my life as normal. From time to time, I would have to sneak into my little sister's room and snatch what was meant for the tooth fairy, or strangle one of the neighborhood cats and pry out its sharp little incisors. Anything to ward off the visions. Anything from a shark tooth necklace to a cavity ridden by cuspid. I also began to notice that Ick would move about my room whenever I left for any length of time, rearranging my stuff and hanging additional curtains. He was even beginning to look more lifelike somehow. In the right light, his teeth would glisten and he was warm to the touch. As much as he creeped me out, I couldn't work up the courage to just destroy him, knowing perfectly well where that would leave me. So I went on collecting teeth for Ick throughout all of high school and college. The older I got, the more things I would learn to fear, the more teeth Ick would need to keep me safe. I'm 22 years old now, with a decent job, my own apartment, and a set of dentures.
been almost a month since Ick's last meal, and the horrors are starting to crowd around me once more. I took a detour through a parking garage after work tonight, found a man fumbling with his car keys. His teeth were stained yellow from a lifetime of cigarettes and coffee. Even still, I had to use a hammer to get out the molars. When I got back to my apartment, he was waiting for me on the ceiling in the corner. Two white eyes and a mouth of razors. How much do you love me? He asked. More than anything, I replied, taking off my coat. More than anything in the world. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much to Mitchell Robinson for sending in the story Disaster Follows. I had a lot of fun with it. I hope you enjoyed what I did with it. Um, I hope those of you who have been really wanting cryptid content were um, satiated, at least for now. And what a better cryptid to use when I hardly ever have cryptid stories on the show than Mothman. I mean, he's the, you know, the biggest and the best. I don't come for me. I'm not sure. I am not very well versed in cryptids. So <laughs> if you are a Bigfoot fan, please don't like egg my house or something. I don't have a house. I live in an apartment. Um, <laughs> look at me. Uh, anyway. Um, yeah. Uh, follow the show on Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook. Why do I have issues with this every single week? I have done the same thing every week for three years, over three years coming up on four. Wow. Almost four. But anyway, yes, follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all at at scare you to sleep, all one word, Facebook. It's a group. So you have to ask to join and just answer if, if, if there are two questions. It's just to weed out bots and creepy people and, you know, all the detritus that is on Facebook. So feel free to literally just answer them podcast podcast because that's a correct answer to both questions as long as I just know that you're not, you know, a sex robot trying to sell uh, viruses, <laughs> you know, um, anyway, uh, what else is there? Oh, if you would like your story considered to be on the show, send it to scare you to sleep at gmail.com where I will possibly pick your story to become a full-blown horror audio production, like I just did this week with Mitchell's story. Um, so yeah, I have so much fun doing that. You know, when I like doing my own stories, but I really find so much joy in producing all of your stories. For one, I feel like it's a fun keepsake for you, and could be a really good marketing material too. By the way, if you ever need like if you have had a story on the show and you want to use it to market your writing or in, in any way or put it on a website feel free that is your story put it wherever you want um yeah and um but I just I don't know taking like what's in your brain and mushing it with with what's in my brain and creating this like baby monster of a like experience for strangers isn't that isn't that so interesting? I just find that so interesting. Um, yeah, maybe someday uh, one of them will get on, get a TV show. Look at Archive 81. Isn't that incredible? I just started Archive 81, by the way, the TV show. It was originally a podcast, as most of you know. It's fucking fantastic. If you haven't started it, oh my God, so good. So good. The story is I mean, I, it's one of those as a writer where you watch and you're like almost jealous because the writing is so good that I wish I was that good of a writer, basically. Um, so yeah. Uh, oh, I made peanut butter brownies this week. Um, they were great. I posted the recipe I used on Scare You to Eat, which is the um, 
offshoot group of Scary to Sleep where we all talk about recipes and stuff. It's fun. Um, and I made uh, gnocchis from scratch this week out of leftover mashed potatoes. That was also fun and very delicious. Um, I think that's all for tonight. I think this, I hope this was a satisfactory amount of rambling. I'm just, my voice is still a little shaky and I ended up having to record a lot more this week to play catch up than I uh, normally do. So it's like my voice is healing. Plus I recorded, I did a lot more voice work this week than usual, um, for various, uh, projects. So, um, I'm going to go. Thank you so much again for all of your love and support. If you're new to the show, welcome. This is a pretty basic episode, so here's what it's all about. Um, Okay, I'm going to go. Remember to drink water, please. I know it's chilly outside and it's harder to drink water. Drink hot water. Oh my God, hot water and lemon is so good. So underrated. Just hot water. You know, it's good. Um, Maybe that's weird, but I like just drinking hot water sometimes. (laughs) So yeah, go drink water um, and go get some sleep. Sweet dreams. Oh, 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 I am so sorry. Before I go, um, Patreon, Patreon, ad free episodes on Patreon. I will be st- starting to upload every single episode, regular episode to Patreon ad free. I heard you. I understand the ads. They're not people's favorites. I get it, but I got to pay bills. But you can go to Patreon and support me there and get ad-free episodes. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. All right. Okay. Go get some sleep. Love you. Uh, Sweet dreams and all that jazz. Bye.